reading from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I just gave this message here on the first day of this year. God is not variable. There's no variance in God. A lot of it in us. We are bounced from one place to another, one uh, doctrine to another, but not God. There's no variance with God. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil take them up into the holy city, and setteth them on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil take them up into an exceeding high mountain, and sheweth them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him. Behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Then, that little word right in the start of that, the little word then. Now, that word indicates a point in time. Then was he led up. Then. But that little word, four letters, indicates a point in time. Now, it'll be interesting this morning for you and I to fix that point with some definitions. I think it'll be a very interesting time and a very good keynote for you and I to begin this year of 1989. We like to know under what circumstance great events transpire. Every thinking person uh, uh, likes to know that. I'm, I'm a very inquisitive person along th those lines. You, you do not see any event in its proper altitude, relationship, and color until you take in the circumstances leading up to and surrounding that event, until you take in the whole of the territory. You know, I, I say the reason that radio is better than a television, you can see more. And that is reason it's better to see with your heart than it is with your eyes. You know, I'm not a great sports fan, but once in a while in the car, the Astros be playing. And I listen to them on that uh, KTRH, and I can see all nine players out there. Uh, every minute of every part of that game. But you hook that up with a television, and you're limited to where they point that camera. Well... When you're limited, you don't know really what's taking place. And, and you and I, to understand any event or to see it in its proper altitude and relationship and color, you have to take in the circumstances leading up to or surrounding that event. When, when therefore I read this, then was Jesus led up. My mind asks me when. When was he led up? At what point? When did this take place in his life? Herod wanted to know what time the star appeared. What wonder if you and I want to know when the devil appeared. Amen. This is the first real view you have of him, you know. And if, if Herod wanted to know when the star appeared, then I don't think there's anything wrong with you and I want to know when the devil showed up. When did he appear? Now to find the answer, you've got to go back to chapter 3. Such are the violent alterations of human experience. Yours, I'm talking to you this morning in this television audience and you sitting here in this room. The, the violent alterations 
of the human experience, baptized and tempted, approved of God, and handed over to the devil. That's what you have right here in this, in this lesson that I've just read to you. Here in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, baptized and tempted, approved of God. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased, then handed over to the devil. Do not question the reality of your experience, and please hear me closely, because here's where I'm heading for. Do not question the reality of your experience, because it was succeeded by a fierce trial. Don't, don't ever question what God has done in your life simply because that you've had to go through a test and that the, the blessing and the touch of God on your life was succeeded by a, a severe test of things. Don't let the enemy tell you that you were mistaken about the dove lighting on you just because you were subjected to difficult circumstances. There's never been a human that walked with God that didn't pass along that line. That's a part of it. And that much we must understand or we become pawns in the hands of an enemy. If I don't know this, then I'm in trouble every time the difficult situation comes. Whenever things don't go like I thought they ought to go or like the, the charlatans of religion told me they would go, then I begin to question the experience that has happened to my life. Read the life of Jesus and find from that life that our relationship to God seemed in their outward aspect to change suddenly and even vitally. Here you have him when he comes up out of the Jordan. The Holy Spirit ascends upon him and out of that cloud comes a voice that said, this is my beloved son. And then immediately the Bible said that God handed him over to the devil. Do you think you any better than he is? I'm going to show you how that works, but I want to tell you, there's a lot of folks who get discouraged when things are mean and hard and difficult. But that's a part of the program. It has to be that way. We can never be real for God until we've been tested on every line, every attitude and emotion of the heart must be tested. Listen, the devil is still a servant of God. God has no trouble with the devil. He could have put him in hell 6,000 years ago, folks. Amen. He only exists to serve the purpose of God in perfecting saints and bringing us into the place that God would have us to be. You're a son of God standing on the bank of the river with the Holy Ghost descending upon you and you're just as much a son of God when tormented and vexed by all the forces of hell. It isn't any difference, folks, but we like to make it. We have been taught so much that the joy of the Lord is simply the ability to shout every now and then. I'm telling you the joy of the Lord is what I do to God when I stand in spite of the circumstances. I'm a child of God. When I'm in a great Holy Ghost meeting like we had last night, and that mantle of the dove is upon me, but I'm still a child and a son of God when all hell has focused itself against me, when torment is there and trouble is there, I'm still a child of God. Can you say hallelujah? I prove my worth right there. I proved my relationship right there. I can tell you, I, I, I watch marriages. Now, over the, oh, over the years that I've been here, I watch marriages tear up over nothing. I said, you ought never been married in the first place. Amen. You ought never have been married in the first place because there are going to be storms come to it. Amen. They're going to be tested. There's going to be times when that woman's going to say she is a fool. But if she hangs around, it may get better. Amen. But I'm saying to you that God has caused you to be a part of himself and you're going to pass through fires. Your sonship doesn't depend upon your moods and your feelings. Never, never. God is not variable. His election are not some opportunities of recalling his decrees. 
when God saved me, then God Almighty committed himself to me. Isn't that wonderful? I said, isn't that wonderful? It is, it is said in this book, I am predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. A great friend of mine of a lot of years, and I say that uh, not lightly when I say a great friend, over a lot of years, said to me just this week, uh, as we were talking, how that a man had deliberately struck him, and he never struck him back. And I said, I believe that may be the first in your life that's saying that the Holy Spirit has worked a work in life and brought you to a place. Thank God my relationship with God Almighty doesn't depend upon my moods. There's a lot of times when the mood's more upbeat than it is at other times. It doesn't depend on my feelings. I just passed through a few days that, that, that it, I like Paul. It seemed like it may be better to go home and be with the Lord. But it had nothing to do with my relationship with God. Storms come and storms go. But God isn't variable. I said God isn't variable. Be sure of your adoption into this family of God. Then have yourselves to be operated on by all the discipline which is of a heavenly appointment. Amen. Have yourself to be operated on by all the discipline that is of a heavenly appointment. And if you walk with God, if you walk with God, you can be sure of this one thing. Whatever is coming down, whatever situation you find yourself in, it's the will of God for you to be there. You, you have to know that. God is working something in my life far more important and an exceeding rich of glory than anything this earth has to happen. I want things, but he says it wouldn't be good for you. I don't understand. Neither does that baby when he's growing up. He wants everything he sees. And you tell him he can't. He can't understand why. But after a while, he'll understand. And if you and I stand with God in a little while, we'll know why that the thing that we ask for may not come. And why we were forced to stand with our loins girt about with truth when it had been a lot easier to quit. Jesus Christ was a son when the dove alighted upon him. And he was a son when the devil set his whole kingdom against him in the wilderness. He's still the son of God. God was as much with him, though not. You know, sometimes God withdraws from us the consciousness of his presence. But he never goes anywhere. He just withdraws the consciousness of his presence. We're not as conscious that he was there as we are at other times. When Eve bit into that apple, God was standing there though she knew it not. He saw her when she took that step away from himself. He never interfered with her choice. But he knew right there. He never, he's never far from us. He's always there. God can't go anywhere. The Bible said God is everywhere. And though I seem to be alone, I'm not alone. Though I seem to be in a struggle that I can't overcome, there is no struggle I can't overcome. If I'm walking with God, the only thing that can defeat me is my disobedience and sin. I'm predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And if I walk with God, I'm going to wake in His likeness. I'm going to wake in the likeness of God. Hallelujah. Then Jesus was led up. Notice that. Jesus was led up. We speak of temptation as if it was an accident of life. Amen. We're always talking about as if whatever's happening to us at the moment is some kind of an accident of life. We forget the words led up. Amen. It was the Holy Spirit that led him where that devil was. You have to, you have to walk through the Old Testament to understand that it was a cloud that led Israel to the Red Sea. It was a cloud that led them to the bitter waters. It was a cloud that led them across that desert. They were led of God because it was necessary for God to test every attitude and motive of that heart. If they're going to go into that promised land, then that attitude and motive of that heart has to be tested. It is absolutely necessary that the Holy Spirit lead you into places where everything that you are is tested. 
Everything is put on the line. The Bible said the trial of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth. Amen. It is here that I'm proving my worth when everything seems to be against me. Yet I stand with my loins girt about with truth. It is right here that I'm testing whether I really know him and he knows me. It is in these times a desire to hang on. These words led up indicate that temptation is a part of the plan. Oh, we don't like to think of it in those terms. But led up, temptation is a part of the plan. It's a step in the succession to a better life. You can never grow without adversity. Listen, folks, the Christian growth, the growth of the Christian is through, is through death and resurrection. In no other way is there room or a place of growth in the Christian experience. I must die. Something in me, something in you must become that burnt offering if there's going to be an increase of Christ. It can't be otherwise. Many called, but few chosen. It's simply because when the test comes, we're many times failed because we're not aware that it's a part of the plan. There's things in that life that God doesn't want in that life. And therefore, God has to bring you to a place that those things surface. Everybody knows it but us. Isn't that something? I said, everybody knows it but us. We have things in our life that are more important to us than God is. And the world out there knows that becomes your God, but we don't know it. We don't know it. We just go on. But God lets us get into a place, and the devil shakes us pretty rapidly, and then things begin to surface. We can whine, we can cry, we can wonder why it ever happened to us, or we can say, thank God, he's trying to work something in this life. God's trying to do something in this life of mine. We can look at it in the proper proper perspective. Amen. We can say it's part of the plan. If you've sinned, then you need to immediately have a look at that. Last night in that service, in the communion service around this altar, we I was dealing with this fact to be or not to be. And in that altar, I said to him, all God has ever needed is a vessel. And when you open up your heart and ask God for a revival, with that asking, you've got to be willing to say to your own heart, the answer is in me. When I ask God to send a revival, God is a revival. All he has to do is reveal himself and that's a revival. And the only thing he's ever needed to reveal himself was a vessel that he could flow through. And when I ask him for a revival, I must be willing to say to my own life, what is in me? You know some people. I have very little people come to me to confess their sins. I'm not a priest, and I don't have a confessor, confession. But I mean, very few people come to me and say, you know, I, I, I've been doing wrong once in a while. Most of them come. So I'm telling you, I don't like the way John's acting. <laughs> I'll tell you, sister so-and-so, she's, she's uh, you know. Well, your attitude being there about sister so-and-so tells me that you ought to have been the one in that altar. I, you know, the Bible says, who are you to judge another man's servant? But if you judge yourself, you won't have to be judged. That's what this book says. Right after he tells us about the communion, Paul moves right into that. He said, if you eat and drink unworthy of this, you, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. But he said, if you'll judge yourself, you won't have to be judged. There's all kinds of folks that can see every kind of a fault in everybody else. But I'm telling you, if we're going to see a real revival, we're going to have to have to see the fault in me. God never, never one time asked me to get out and pray to see what's wrong with my good friend over here, Bo. He never asked Bo to save God straighten the preacher out. But it is, it is cleansing and saying to God to let me see what you see when you look at me. Not, not what, you, what you see when you look at my friend Brother Byram, but at myself, if I get me right, I'm, I've got this church a little closer to revival. And if you'll deal with the frustrations of your own life, the jealousy, the malice, the envy, and the super spirits of your own life, then you brought this church to a place where we can have a move of God in it that'll work the works of God. 
led up. Sometimes we delude ourselves with foolish imagination that if we step there softly, we can get by the serpent's nest without him hearing us. You know, we make ourselves believe that. You know, we just walk tiptoe, put on soft soul shoes. We, we ease by the devil without him seeing us. Now, you've deluded yourself. I said, you've deluded yourself. This book said they were led to that place. Amen. There ain't no slipping by. That, that's a mean and unworthy view of life, folks. Let me tell you, you're not going to be exempt. This book makes a promise to you. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That is a promise of God. I like the promise. I'm the Lord that healeth thee. I give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him. I try to skip over that one that says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus. If you don't want to be subject to the persecution, then live like the devil. If you live godly, you ain't going to slip past the serpent's nest. Amen. He's going to be all cast, and the Holy Ghost is going to lead you right there. Let me tell you something, folks. Life itself is a temptation. I said life itself is a temptation. To be here is to be nearly lost. Amen. Are you listening? I said life itself is a temptation. To be here is to be nearly lost. Amen. There is everything out there geared to destroy me. Everything. And the one way if that devil can make me believe that because that he's been allowed to shake me up a little that God has forsaken me, then that's the shortest route to destruction. Amen. That's the shortest route. I don't understand why that certain things go through. But I'll tell you one thing. I saw the difficult situations come. And I saw people in prayer meetings that never were there before. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. You might miss some of it if you begin to pray before it happens. But you see, to be here, to be here at all, is to be nearly lost. To be here at all in this world is to be in the devil's hands. Amen. But greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Yes, sir. I can tell you the Bible said he's a God of this world. He, he's going to be reckoned with and put in the pit forever one day, thrown into a lake of fire. But right now he's about because God is using him to sharpen up your spiritual life. Amen. The laziness of our life has to be shook up. We become prayerless. We neglect the Bible. We neglect God. Amen. We lose our desire for spiritual things. You know, you, you can look at you and see your spiritual appetite is so low sometimes. Amen. You can, just, you can just set through and never know what's going on. But God wants to awaken us to the spiritual uh, things of, of Himself. So that we're constantly aware of God in our lives and about us. Understand that you have to be tempted. You have to be tempted. Now that's, that's, that is hard sometimes for us to get with the preaching that's about us. And I understand that I'm almost like an illegitimate child at a family reunion when I begin to say things like that. Amen. That's not a very popular statement. But you have to be tempted. There's no way that your life can be built. The spiritual muscles cannot be put there. Joseph has to go through that dungeon before he can ever be the prime minister of Egypt. There's no way God is going to take a small boy and put him over a nation, a selfish, small person. There's no way God is going to use our life with all of its selfishness and its give me, give me to it. There's going to be a breaking of that life and a bringing of it. And temptation has to be a part of it. And the word temptation in the Bible mostly is a word tested. Tested. It says God cannot be tempted. He can't be tempted to do wrong. That's true. But he can't be tested either. What do you test God with? Amen. You, you, you have to be. You, your, your profession, you say, I'm a Christian. And then it's going to be put to the test. There's going to be things come against you. I had a man call me this morning. And he, I, don't, I never knew him, but 
He wanted me to pray. He's, he'd been going to school and he said, I got pushed beyond the endurance and blew up and quit and I was doing good and I was all this. I said, well, you don't have to blow up. You belong to God? Yes, you don't have to. But I said, you do. And so God put you where you'd blow up. And I said, it cost you your college education if you don't get straightened up. It'll cost you a whole lot more. It'll cost you heaven if you don't deal with it right. After a while, God quit dealing with you about it and just let you, let you have your own way. But you don't have to do that. I don't have to give place to this flesh. I don't have to get angry. I don't have when people, when people revile against me, I don't have to revile again. I don't have to curse because I'm cursed. I don't have to hit because I'm hit. I don't have to treat people wrong because they treated me wrong. I can pray for those that despitefully use me because I'm a child of God. But when you say you're a child of God, God's going to let us be found out whether you are or not. Oh, yes, sir. There'll be those that'll tap on you. There'll you be pushed to the limit. There'll be those that'll test every everything, everything. Amen. Be the family. There's folks sitting here this morning will tell you that nothing can test it anymore than the family. Closest, closest uh, relatives die. And they won't even call you and tell you they're dead. Amen. That, that's a test on everything. But if you can still say hallelujah anyhow, then there's something happening. But if all the devil has to say is boo and you blow up, break up, run off, then you never have nothing in the first place. You need to know that. You need to know it before you get to hell. Amen. And if God's ever going to perfect you and use your life, then that life is going to have to be put under pressure. This gospel only works by it being on the inside, the pressure on the outside. And it does not work otherwise. Problem here in America. We, you know, the pressure has been took off of. I think it's coming back. You know, it looks to me like we're, we're, we're walking in this... An affluent world on a rotten cover. Amen. $180 billion is it's going to take to bail out the savings and loans. Well, that just means we're already broke with $2 trillion in debt overseas to the Japanese. They own us now. Your grandkids will be paying rent to them if something doesn't change. And we're, we're already and talking about bailing out the, the malfunction of people that didn't know how to handle their money. I can tell you they don't have $180 billion, but they printed it. That's a reason inflation. The only way they're going to be able to pay that debt is to inflate the money. You can hear me. You couldn't tax enough to pay off what we owe. I'm just telling you that to tell you there ain't no hope out there. There ain't no hope out there. God is going to test us and pressure us and bring us, ladies and gentlemen, to a place that the only thing on this earth that matters is God. And we come to a place we can shout when we are bound. We can shout when we're abased, we can shout when we have a lot, and we can shout when we don't have anything. Because if we have God, we have everything. If you have Jesus, you have everything. But we want Jesus and everything. You have to be tempted. Let me tell you something, folks. The wilderness is not a spear lying a thousand miles off your path. Are you listening? I said the wilderness is not a spear lying a thousand miles off your path. The wilderness is in your path and you're not going to escape it. You're going to walk through it or you're going to quit in it. Amen. You're going to pass through that desert. You're going to pass through that wilderness. You're going to pass through that when every attitude of your heart toward Christ is tested. The Israelites were tested. They hated that manna. Then when Jesus came on the scene hundreds of years later, he said, I am that manna. You hated me. That's the reason you never got there. Everything. If your love to him is a love because of what he's done for you, then all he's got to do is cut that off. Then you hate him. Well, you're going to know that because he already knows that. He already knows that. He knows exactly what you'll do under any kind of a pressure. But he lets the pressure come because you don't know what you'd do. And he wants you to know how ugly we can get. I was praying just not this last week, but week before last. I missed 
some of the prayer meeting this week is sick. And I, I was praying early in the morning. I'm telling you, I had a hold of that wire. You could just feel that Holy Ghost everywhere. There must have been 50 of us out there, and everybody seemed like he had a banana long as a fence rail. I tell you, the Holy Ghost was working. I, in the midst of that great Holy Ghost move, I said, Oh, God, let me see Clinton and like you see him. I no sooner said that than I wish I'd have kept my mouth shut. Because it's an ugly thing sometimes. I told him here last night, I guess, first thing I saw, how selective we are in prayer. We really believe we know more who God will save than He does. Some of those nice people that we just know would get saved, they ain't never going to get saved. Them's mean as a devil that we don't think will ever come to God. They're the very ones to listen if you talk to them. But we're so selective, you know. We're, we're uh, you know, we, we just, certain people we're going to let in anyway. If we could just see ourselves like God sees us, I'm telling you, I wouldn't have no trouble calling you in this altar. You'd already been here. While I yet speak, you'd already been in this altar. If we just get a glimpse of ourselves, listen, and that, that, that wilderness is right down the road there, just like with Israel. That cloud led them 40 years, then let most of them die out there because the attitude never could be straightened up. From the moment that trouble came and the hot sand touched their feet, they wanted to go back to Egypt. The Bible said, uh, Paul writing about Demas, said he left me because he loved this present world. He decided he had it better in the world than he had with God, and he went back. You can do that anytime you want to. All the devil has to do is put a little pressure on you. God's going to let him put that pressure. I don't speak of willingness and temptation and devil as if they were a universe over which God has no control. You listen to me. No, no. I don't, I don't speak of I, 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 temptation and the devil and the wilderness and all of this. The Lord God rules and the devil is his slave. Oh, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I said God rules and the devil's his slave. And if I walk with God, I ain't never going to be lost. I believe in eternal security. Amen. I believe I can... I, I, no man can ever take me away from Christ. No man can ever take me away from Christ. I believe I can walk out here and quit. I can, I can go out there. I got enough money in my pocket. I can buy a bottle of liquor. Amen. I could have celebrated like them poor simple things were last night uh, all over here. And them beer joints and bars, people testifying. Last year, I was in one of them. But thank God tonight, it's a different story. <laughs> I can tell you, I don't ever have to go back there. You listen to me. No, sir. I am as safe as if I was in devil in heaven with the door locked. It doesn't matter what comes against me. I can make it. I'm going to make it. Thank God if I stay with him, he'll stay with me. God rules the devil's a slave. I must always know that. He used a lot of things. I mean, he used a lot of things. John Wesley, he attributed a mean wife. He's making it to heaven. She used to come into meetings where that great man preaching stand up and tell her, he ain't nothing. He ain't nothing. He's a devil. Said he'd be down praying. She'd come get a hold of his hair and jerk his hair. Said she kept me on my knees. I'm either going to beat the devil out of her or pray. He said I chose to pray. <laughs> she kept me on my knees seeking God. Amen. Oh, listen, God, God's got a man here. God's got a man here who's going to shake a world with. And you just can't do that with just every little thing you pick up. You've got to pass him through the storm. He's got to go through the fire. Amen. He's got to get iron in his soul. He can't lay down and whine every time, every time the wife said he wasn't any good. He's got to know whether he's good or not. That's all. I've got to know whether I belong to God or not. And then somebody comes along, don't think I do. That doesn't have anything to do with it. If I know I do, then whatever's coming against me is the will of God. And somehow in it all, it's to shape me and form me. God is not variable. He committed himself to conform me to the image of Christ. And he knows exactly what it takes to get me there. He knows. Some of us, he has to treat mean or others. Some folks are easy, more pliable. You take clay that's damp and soft, you can just do with it.
But you take one that gets a little dry and crusty, and you, you have to water it again. You see what they do with that clay? They'll bang it down and they'll beat on it with a fist, trying to get it where it'll make something out of it. Well, that's, that's what's going on. It's trying to get you where you can shape you. You know, in Burkina Faso, they have there one of the great talents is brass. And they, they carve those. I brought a man home carrying bass, a beautiful piece of work. But they carve that out of honeycomb. Amen. Somehow. Then they take mud and, 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 and put it all around it. Just very carefully. They put that clay around it. And then when they fire it up, when they fire it up, the honeycomb melts and comes out. Then they pour the brass on the inside, and out comes the most beautiful figure in whatever they're making. Amen. But they put the heat, they put the heat to that honeycomb, and it just and it just runs out. Well, that God in these temptations, that flesh will turn to blubber and run if you let it stay in the fire. Amen. God dealing with us to perfect us and to beautify us, and he committed himself to me in the beginning. But if I won't leave, he will conform me, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Do not speak with bated breath about this matter of temptation as if it is possible to sneak into heaven, folks. No, no. Let me, let me tell you here this morning. Don't go around whispering like you're going to be able to sneak by the devil or sneak into heaven. That isn't going to work at all. No, sir. When you get there, S.D. Gordon made this statement a long time ago. He said, there will be a cross at that gate. And if you get there, that cross says nothing gets here but Christ. Nothing goes through this gate but what's of Jesus. Amen. Flesh and blood shall not inherit this world. Amen. Only that which is of Christ is going to eventually make it. God's going to have to deal with everything else. Some parts of it is stubborn. Amen. It's stubborn. It's difficult. I must be assailed. I must be tried. I must be tormented. I must be vexed. And if I've not passed through experience of this kind, the whole priesthood of Christ has been lost on me. I know when that gets out on the TV that there's folks out there that are going to say that I'm, I'm a legalist or worse. But I'm just telling you, perfection demands a dealing when those stones were pulled out of that quarry for that temple, God said, I want every one of them shaped before they get there. I don't, want, I don't want no sound of hammer. I don't want no sound of chisels. When they come there, I want them all ready. And they had a particular place. That thing was so drawn out that every stone knew where it was going to be or they knew the mason knew where it was going to be when it got there. And it just slipped into that temple. Amen. And when you see where they've dug up, you can't pass a knife blade in there. But if you'd have been there and watched him as he got a hold of that stone, shaping it up with that chisel, as he bounced at those knots and rough places, as he smoothed it, finally got down to small, fine tuning of it to make it fit into there. Then you read in the Apostle Peter's writing that you're a lively stone building up a spiritual house and that God is going to shape you up here so there's no rocket at that rapture, folks. When these stones come together to fit into place, you won't be able to pass a nice blade between us. All those differences and things will be dealt with here. I can tell you it's painful to take the knots off of us. It's painful when God begins to deal with those things that divide us. We have never fit together from around the world now. And it's painful for God to deal with those things because it's evident they're important to us. If they wasn't, we'd already done away with them. Isn't that right? If they wasn't painful, listen. If they wasn't, if they wasn't important, we'd already done away with them. But God, God is going to cut off everything. Whatever that keeps you and I from being able to stand side by side in eternity, God's going to cut it off. Amen. Now, that, that's a painful experience, but it's a necessary experience. If there be no experiences of this kind to pass through, then the cross of Christ is an exaggeration of remedial measures. Amen. You hear me? If there be 
no experiences of this kind to pass through in the part of the Christian, then the cross of Christ is an exaggeration for remedial measure, and there's no need for the heart of the Son of God to burst in pity or sacrifice. There was absolutely no need for him to die if there aren't experiences like this to pass through. If it's what the theologians and the and the, and the neo-Pentecostal have come to tell us is true. If you just get saved and just everything's just wonderful, no more testing, no more devils, no more trials, no more torment, no more vexing. And I'm telling you, Christ ought never to have died. Count it not strange when temptations befall you to be finite. Is to be tempted, tested. Sometimes, sometimes we prolong, we prolong the agony because we don't submit. He loves us too much, too much to turn us loose. The Bible said, with every temptation, a way of escape has been made. Now we've made that a kind of a comfort. But I, I don't believe that's what he meant. I believe he meant that when he's put you in the vice, if you're just too soft to take it, he'll let you out. He'll let you out. But you're going to be the loser. You're going to be the loser when it's through. Amen. You're going to be the one that lost it when it's all over. And in the stress of things, if I can always know that he's making me, he's making me. He taught me that money don't mean anything. He passed me through a time that I left almost single-handed over a half a million dollars. And I passed through storms. I prayed, Lord, let me ride one of these airplanes by myself and have enough insurance to pay that off and just let her go. I, you know, I, 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 I lived in that time. But I tell you what, I thought the test would never end. But when it ended, I saw there's nothing to that, folks. He's let more pass through my hands, but we kept it passing. We kept it passing because... We learn. I didn't know where it is. If you have God, you have everything. But you can have everything else in this world. But if you don't have God, you don't have nothing. Because you're going to die pretty soon. Now from this point of view, temptation is a part of the divine scheme. The devil is under the control of God. He's on a leash. He can't go any further. than God will let him go. He can't move beyond the limits. But if you want to be perfected and you want God to use that life, then there's a lot of you has got to die. And the death is going to be painful. It's going to be lonely. You're going to be feel tormented and vexed. But if you examine in that heart, see that I'm walking with God. And you're going to come to the wells of Elam after a while. Amen. Thank God. The desert's going to be behind you. You're going to rest a while before you move on in this road of perfection. If you're on a mountaintop this morning rejoicing in victory, dare look ahead of you. There's a desert out there. You'll be back there after a while. If you're in a desert and it's dry and hot, look ahead of you yet. There's a mountain. There's victory. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, today, forever. God is not variable. I'm a son of God when filled with the Holy Ghost and the joy and the peace it follows. I'm a son of God when vexed and tormented by forces about me. God is not variable. Bow your head. Father, thank you this morning for this precious holy time the people in this television audience that have joined us tonight, this morning, I bless them in Jesus' name. Help them to know, those in fierce trial, that you're working out your eternal will. Good night. God bless you.